Well, it's good to be back. I would say great, but it was great to be there. So, um, I don't know. I thought you'd laugh at that, but you didn't. So, uh, it was really exciting to be in Israel again. It's been five years, and so let's pray, and uh, we'll get into this. Father in heaven, thank you for an opportunity to be in your word, and for an opportunity, Lord, to have experienced Israel. We pray that uh, as we come back to your word, we've had an opportunity for some of us to walk in the word and the place of the, the, where the word originated, and now we have an opportunity, Lord, to, to help others experience some of that as well. We pray that you would bless our time together this morning as we come in this area of Nehemiah. May we recognize, Lord, the transition and how you work to build things in our life and you work to keep things strong in our life. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so uh, I want to bring to you a little bit of our pictures about our trip and some of those kind of things. So, so if you didn't follow my wife on Facebook, don't, I, I'm not, I don't put as many things on Facebook as she does. And so that's kind of our trip. Let me talk about it. Was, it was fantastic. This is our group. Um, we are on the southern steps there, and Jesus walked there. He may have even taught there. And so that's our whole group, Motley Crue, except for the two photo bombers in the back. And so other than that, um, I'll tell you a little bit about our trip. We were uh, staying at, uh, let's see, it's Kibbutz Megan, and uh, I just call it after Megan, right? And so uh, this is looking out from our dining room window one, one morning, just checking out. This is the Sea of Galilee, and so this next picture, we're now looking kind of to the north of that area, about 13 miles. That's how long the, the lake is. That's where, the, where Capernaum would be, and so we're just that far away. It's just beautiful. Uh, it's an amazing kind of a place. It's very tropical. It feels like Southern California in some ways, and it's just gorgeous, okay? Um, so so when uh, I was blessed just about five minutes away from here to, to baptize 13 of our group uh, in the very frigid waters of the Jordan River, okay? Uh, it, that, this water comes off of Mount Hermon, okay? Mountain runoff. I, and by the time I baptized the fifth person, my toes were frozen. Um, by the seventh person, I couldn't feel my knees. I'm going to stop explaining from there on out, okay? But I was cold. It was cold, and they only had to go in and under for a minute. It was just freezing cold, but it was gorgeous. It was beautiful. We had a, uh, you know, for $10, they'll rent you a robe and give you a certificate. They'll do every, in Israel, it's like that, everywhere you go, right? Um, not only that, we, went, we visited ancient Ketzerin, um, and that's a, a village where they dress us up, and we get to walk literally through a village of that time. You know, you're looking at, at people that are in our group. That's our group right there. Uh, there were 40 of us, and they put us in robes, and then we walk through the village, and you get a hands-on feeling of what it was like to be in a, a village of Jesus' time. We actually got to learn what it was like to, 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 to crush the olives to make olive oil. We got to see them gathered then and smashed to collect the olive oil. Then we walked over. We got to see a synagogue that would have been like he would have been. Walk in a home that was exactly like it would have been Jesus to look up at the roof and go, that's probably where they, you know, like they could have let, let, you know, taken the roof apart to bring someone down and then we got to go and 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 make on an open fire bread like they would have done so it was like such a and that was like even i mean we did this before 10 o'clock in the morning we had all that our days were packed um and they'll tell you they someone would go like i don't know how we're going to be better than yesterday that was awesome and then the next day was even better and then better and it was just amazing right and so it was great so let me tell you some more so we spent five nights three nights in the north and five nights in the city of jerusalem i got up early one morning you can just see the little brown mound right there oh i brought my pointer this is the church of the holy sepulcher we were like right there in that church of the holy sepulcher right there and and so it was just gorgeous one morning and um and so then the next picture i'll show you now you can you see the dome we're just like a few minute walk to to the the, the dome and so I, one of my things that when i'm there is i start walking people around the city and i'm quizzing them on how to get here to there because they get like a shot with me where, where you're going to know where and cindy did fine because she was able to find where she could spend money easily right tom i and tom's kind of mad at me still because i she's too familiar with jerusalem and so um but right now it was good it was a blast um and so people you know uh we walk down to the wall i think that's next is that next um yeah so we went our first night there we go down to the western wall and i go twice before dinner and after dinner and the first time there's hardly anybody there i didn't show you that picture but then the second time it's just packed people are dancing and you can see there's all different kinds of garb that they wear based on their tradition or who the rabbi is that they follow and so being staying right there in the city we got exposure to the city at different times and different kinds of people and different experiences which was amazing um we went to the uh, national museum we spent two hours in the national museum uh, you were how many here last week when pastor Newt was talking about sambal a lot. 
Well, this is a seal from Sambala. We're walking through the, 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 uh, the museum, and I actually was talking to somebody and I almost missed it, and Phil pointed out to me, goes, hey, that's Sambala. This is the seal impression from the governor of Samaria, right? Like he was an official dude. He was really, you know, bringing it against Nehemiah and that group, and we saw something from that time period. You know, when you know the Bible and you walk through a museum, things come alive, and you're like, I know that name. I know what that's from. I get that, and you, the pieces all start to come together because you've been studying the word of God, and these things just pop and you're like oh i get this and then so that's what's amazing when you go to israel all these things you've been studying all your life just start to come alive and your your faith goes it's real it's not just a story it's not and so it was so cool i went back in time and you can see here's a picture of me i went all the way back in time i did a time machine right there i am what a dork okay um i'm not dressed appropriately because it was cold where i was but i went back in time and they're on robes just kidding and that's this cool mural that kind of shows you what a a, 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 a a cardo is a cardo was the main drag where the stores were where things were and you learn so much about not just the bible times but about how they lived and what they went through in these kind of times and so it's cool I, I learned things I hadn't seen or known about five years ago. New discoveries of things, right? Check this out. First century synagogue in, in Magdala. Remember Mary Magdalene? This is new since I've even been there. When they, were, they were discovering it back then, but it hadn't been made public. And so we got to walk through and see this. And we, we have a special guide, Thomas, with us right here. And he's doing a great job. Oh, go back one. Uh, go back on, I'll talk about Thomas. And so he was doing a great job teaching our group, and we're getting to see all this. This, this is what's happening in Israel. They decide, well, they're going to put a hotel. See the hotel behind it? We're going to do a hotel. And then this is the contractor's worst nightmare. They start digging, and they find the tell, or they find something they have to excavate around, right? We have that kind of thing with if you find a, a, a Native American kind of something, and you have to stop and do that. Well, they're finding that all over Israel, so they're making all these new discoveries of things that weren't even there uh, years ago. So I was so excited. Our guide is uh, Tisha, and she was fantastic. She's been doing this for all, all, so many years. That's Udi. He's our bus driver behind me. He was photobombing with Wayne. And so, um, but it was great. She knew the biblical history of the Bible. She knew the ancient history of the Bible, and she knew like, the recent history of the nation of Israel. So she brought it all to life for us. And then she was dumped us off because she needed to go be with, um, what was the guy's name? Who's it? Mike Huckabee or somebody, right? She was doing a tour with him. And so she's like, a, she was like dropping names like Sandra Palin and all these people she's done tours for. And she worked with us. <laughs> it was fun. And so we had a great time. And so, but we were so blessed. I'll bring up some things like that. She taught me something I didn't realize. Both the first and the second temple were destroyed on the ninth month of the 11th day. 9-11. Whoa. And so you wonder about things that are, that are attacks and destroyed. And it hit me like that. Like, I didn't know that. I don't remember. I've been studying the Bible for a while. And so, like, these new revelations that hit you in these ways that are just like, whoa, whoa. And so and God's been doing this thing in Israel. He's been building and rebuilding. This is a look over look of the city, you know. And, and God has been rebuilding. He calls Abraham here to build something. Right, offer Isaac, not Ishmael. He calls him to this, and he, he's going to call David to take the city uh, from the Jebusites and make it his place. And he's going to call David to bring uh, bring the tabernacle to come be at this place. And he places it on David's heart to begin the process of building a temple here. But he tells him, "You can't do it because blood's on your hand." But I'll tell you what: I'm going to let your son do it. Your son's going to build a temple in this spot. And he's he, Jesus. God, the Father, calls Jerusalem his holy city, his place. And so when you go to his place, and I had a Jewish guy that I talked to in the old city uh, for a while just kind of saying, when you have visited God's house, you go home differently. This is God's house. I mean, there is this sense of being in a place that God calls his home that I can't explain if you've not been there. And if you've been there, and I encourage you to think about this next time we go, because God is doing something where he, it's been built and rebuilt. It's been destroyed by the world, and it's been rebuilt. And what God is doing, and even in the story of Nehemiah, and he's doing it in your life and in my life, he is taking what the devil wants to destroy, and he is rebuilding it over and over. And there are times when the devil wants to come in and destroy you, and defeat you, and make you feel like giving up. 
And yet the, let God comes through Jesus Christ to remind you, I'm not done with you. I am going to rebuild the walls in your life. I am going to build up something in you because I am not finished with you yet. Amen. You might feel defeated. You might feel like giving up. And you might feel like you got a temple thorn in your flesh. There's something else that you just can't get rid of. And saying, Lord, I want to get this out of my life, but I can't. And for some reason, Lord, I feel like I'm plagued by this. And I want, Lord, to be set free. And he says, the time is coming for you. I'm going to rebuild your life. I am going to do something in you. I have not given up on you. And so we're in Nehemiah chapter 7. Finally, we get to the Bible. Okay. All right. Nehemiah 7 verse 1. Okay, chapter 7 and verse 1. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, you can turn in the Pew Bible in front of you, page 759. Okay, grab one, 759, the blue one that's there, and and you can read along with us, chapter 7, verse 1. All right, Nehemiah, chapter 7 and verse 1. After the wall had been rebuilt, and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most do. Verse 3. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be open until the sun is hot, while the gatekeepers are still on duty. Keep them shut. uh, Keep them shut the doors and, and bar them. Have them, sorry. Uh, Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their houses. Now the city was large and spacious. Not today, um, but then. But there were very few people in it. And the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. This is what I found written there. These are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive. They returned to Jerusalem and Judea, each to his own town. I'll stop there. A lot of it, the rest is a whole list of names. Chapter 1 through 6 is the construction of the walls. Turning point now. Chapter 7 through 12 is consolidating the inside of the city. Construction, consolidation. Chapter 1 through 6, Nehemiah is the general contractor. Chapters 7 through 12, Nehemiah is the general manager, okay? Chapters 1 through 6, Nehemiah is the entrepreneur. He is initiating a project to get it started. Chapters 7 through 12, Nehemiah is the executive. He is now administrating or organizing the city. There's a transition. This is a key transition in the book. It's key for us to understand there are some changes going to happen throughout the rest of the book. Focused on a project, focused on the people, okay? So there's a bit of a difference. What's the big idea here? What's the point of this change of this part of this book now? You must guard what you have gained. You and I, as well, must guard the spiritual gains that we make in our life, or we will lose them. Must guard them. Now, three ways that we guard them. First is that God invites us into ministry. Godly leaders, God himself delegates. God delegates leadership. He delegates things to us. And he sets that in guard. You've got to set up a guard. You've got to set things into position. So he's going to set people up into positions. Set up a guard. Okay. Now, verse 1, chapter 7, verse 1. After the wall had been rebuilt, I had set the doors in place. Protection. Okay. I set the gatekeepers up. That's more like people police, right? Police people in the city or on the guard. So more protection, right? Singers, a worship team, okay? Focus, okay? This is what our focus is. Let's get together. These people are getting, the the worship team helps us focus on worshiping the Lord, okay? Protection of our value, okay? Uh, And then the Levites, they are the gene makers, okay? You didn't get it, okay? You'll get it later. Levite, no, those are the assistants to the priests, 
Priests have their job. The Levites help them with their jobs. Okay, the Levites are the ones that help uh, uh, officiate the, the, the sacrifices and organize all of the things for the ministry. So he sets all of these people in place. Why? He's, why does he lump them all together? He puts them all in this one thing because the gatekeepers, the, the singers, the Levites are all protecting the priority of worship of this, in the city of, of Jerusalem. That is the priority is that we are to worship God. That's the priority in our life as well. There are going to be a lot of things that are going to want to command your attention in life. Who do you put first? What do you put first in your life? Is God central to your life? Is he the focal point, the focus of your life? Yes, you've got lots of things going on, but what's most important? And that's the question that he's setting up here. We've got to put these things up. No, and if, if you're in leadership or management or anything like that, you're going to notice there are no Books, no management books in the Bible, but there are many, many management principles in the Bible. Okay, so if you're a leader, or if you're a manager, or you're executive, you're talking, you got to notice that in the Bible it is filled with business. It's filled with ideas of leadership on how do we do things, and one of them here is to delegate. Nehemiah begins in the beginning of the book; he's doing everything, and now he is delegating, and now he's bringing other people along. Now that the project has been coming along, he's been handing that off. He's handing off to other leaders. These are key things that have to happen in the job, and this is true in your life and in your family. You got to bring everybody along. That means I got to take the vision for this city and I got to get it to everyone else. You need to get the vision for your life for following the Lord and you've got to pass that along to your family members. If you're the only one that holds the vision for your life, what's going to happen to the rest of your family as they grow up? They're not going to follow your vision for following the Lord. You want to pass along that and you need to start delegating the responsibilities. And so that's what Nehemiah is teaching us. C.S. Lewis wrote it this way about divine delegation. He, God seems to do nothing of himself which he can possibly delegate to his creatures. He commands us to do slowly and blunderingly what he could do perfectly and in the twinkly of an eye. Creation seems to be the delegation through and through, to be delegation through and through, and I suppose this is because he is a giver. So he gives away the responsibilities to us. Second reason we should guard what we have gained is because God chooses people who are more faithful and focused on him. Notice this. Have you ever noticed in your life that, that if, you don't, if you make progress on something in your life and if you don't uh, gain, guard it, you lose it? Anybody ever studied a foreign language years ago and you've lost most of it? I was reminded this last couple of weeks that, that I took three semesters of Hebrew and it is not very strong. Oh my goodness, there was, I'm, oh, things were coming back as we were looking all over, but boy, I is not very strong. I need to really work on my Hebrew. Um, how many of you started a diet in January? Right? Okay, don't put your hands up. This is not confession. Okay, all right, because you know where I'm going with that, right? You started, and maybe for the first couple, you were rocking it. You were doing a great job, and you were losing weight, and now has it come back? I mean, you don't have to do much for it to come back. It just comes back, right? I, I have a watch that gives me these exercise goals that, I, that I'm kind of obsessive compulsive about liking to do. And, I, and January 1st comes rolling around, and it's the goal is 206 miles this month. Walk, run, jog, wag. That's like walking and jogging at the same time for me, you know, if I can't run, you know what I mean? And I'm like, how can I do 206 miles this month? There are, that's 6.6 .6 miles a day. That's a lot of running for me. Not for you, Scott. I know you can do a lot, right? He's a stud. Right? Okay, but I can't. I can't. I'm old. And so, um, and so I'm like, all right, how am I going to do this? So, all right, I got to figure out if I, if I walk around on Sundays, I, 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 why do you think I do this back and forth? Because I got to get my, my steps in, right? No, just kidding. Right? But, 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 but I'm like, oh, how many of my, some days I sit in meetings all day. Some days I sit by them. And so I'm like, all right, finally, by the end of the month, I'm like hitting my 6.6 six mi six miles a day, and I'm doing pretty good. I get on, some days on the treadmill, I'm on there for a long time. Chris goes to Bible study, I can go back on the treadmill and I can just run there for a while. And so I'm like, I'm on track, I'm on track. And I get to the end of the month and I'm right there, okay? Last day of the month, I'm about to get to 206 miles. And, and, and just a couple days before it, I'm like, oh man, when I get it, I gotta get myself a carrot. Carrots suck. Okay, I'm gonna get myself some ice cream. That's gonna be my treat, my reward, right? And so like, I don't know, I like ice cream. I've ever told you that. Like I, my love handles, I named Ben and Jerry and in German, Hagen Doss. That's what I named my, my love handles, okay? I don't know if you ever heard that, okay? And so, 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 so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna celebrate getting my 206 miles in. And so I did Cherry Garcia, 
okay? You know what I'm saying? Okay? And so I get it, and then I'm eating it, and I'm like, on the third bite, I realize, crud. I worked this hard to put it right back on. What am I doing? And did I stop? And, and No, I just paused. I continued to eat, right? Because, you know, because like I, I did the victory. I did 206 miles. But that's our problem, right? That's our problem is, is like we're going to make progress. And then before, if we don't guard it, it's going to come back. And the same spiritually in our life. If I don't guard the gains that I make with the Lord spiritually, you know, it's not hard for me to grow weeds at home. But if I don't want weeds, you look at my grass, they're full of weeds. If I just neglect it, the weeds come easily. And that's true in our spiritual life. And so what he's talking about here is, look what he says, verse 2. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani. Remember that guy? Chapter 1, verse 2. He comes to him with a passion for the walls to be rebuilt. Right? I don't know if it's his physical, biological brother or brother, like Jewish brother. I don't know which one it is. And then Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most do. Now, now when it says the word citadel, I don't know what it means for citadel. I struggle with trying to understand it. Let me give you a picture. Okay, this is Herod's temple. And so you can kind of see this is the Antonio uh, Palace. Um, named after uh, Marcus uh, 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 Antonius, uh, or, or Anthony. Um, and so, it's, uh, and then this is David's citadel over here. And so what you can kind of see is, and, 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 and having been to Israel, some of you can learn this a little bit better because we saw a model of it change, is, is this is built on a hill. So you can see that the wall is much bigger here and it slopes this way. Herod actually has some of this excavated so that it's not as tall. But the wall at this end of the building, if this is where the original citadel was, and he says he's going to put a stronger force up there it's because that's the most vulnerable part of the whole walled area because as the as it goes up like this and the wall is kind of flat it's taller on the on the at the western wall at the southern western wall area and it's sh- more shallower at the northern end and so when he says i'm going to put someone who i can trust in the area where we're most vulnerable you get that You're going to put in the places of your life people you can trust most where you know we're weakest. Do you get that? And we've got to guard what we've gained or we can lose it. Guard what you gained or we can lose it. And notice what he says. He was a man of integrity and he feared God more than most do. And this word for for, uh, fear or or, or not fear, for integrity um, is this word faithful. And it is reliable. And, and, and here's the question I ask you this morning. How do we translate the word faithfulness in our lives? How do we define faithful? How do you define if you are a faithful follower of God? Are you? Are we a faithful follower of God? I'm going to put it away. I heard a pastor say it. I'm only going to ask you to apply the same standard of faithfulness to your spiritual life as you do to your everyday life. If you read your Bible three out of five times a week, is that faithful? If you go to church three out of four weeks a month, is that faithful? If you tithe 10 out of 12 times a year, is that faithful? What does it mean to be faithful to God? Now I want you to consider this with other things in your life. Parallel to other things and how you consider other things faithful in your life. If you were to show up to work three out of five days of the week, will your boss consider you faithful? But you think you're faithful when you read the Bible three out of five. If your employees come to work three out of five or four out of five, because we go to church four out of five times a month maybe, right? Would you consider, would your boss consider you faithful? You see our standards, is double standard. If your microwave worked three out of five times, if your car worked three out of five times, would you consider it faithful? And yes, we sell ourselves short. Would the bank consider you faithful if you tithe 10 out of 12 months a year? We're not nearly as faithful to God as we expect intangible items to be to us. Do you get that? And yet we're so proud of ourselves. And yet the truth is 
We have such high expectation, even us as coaches of athletes and teachers of students, to put in the work to do this. Yet we don't do that for God. Where are we falling down in our relationship with God? When he calls us to be faithful, we're not there yet, folks. Are you with me? Do you understand what I mean? I think we've disconnected the truth is in our life that we think we're maybe doing better than we are. And I want to cry, Lord, have mercy. I want to be a faithful man of God. Uh, remember the parable. Uh, remember that. And, and, and this is the next point. Many people today are more afraid of disappointing people than God. I think when I listen to people talk, I don't want to offend someone, so I don't tell them the truth. I don't want to share this with my wife because I don't want to offend her. I'm worried. And we're more afraid of talking or saying the wrong thing to someone and we don't care what God thinks. Folks, do we have a reverence for God? This is where this man is lifted up and God says, this is the person I'm going to elevate. Remember in Galatians chapter 1, he says, for we don't seek the approval of man, but of God. Am I being trying to be a man pleaser? No, I'm not trying to be a man pleaser or I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul says you can't be both. Do you remember the parable of the talents? The person, you were faithful and little, so you will be given more. Folks, I'm calling us to put on guard and to be faithful to the things that God has done in our life so we don't lose them. So we don't lose these things that God's blessed us with. Remember what Paul tells to, in Titus. He says, 2-4, he says, For we speak as messengers approved by God, entrusted with good news for the purpose to please God. Not people. He alone examines the motives of our heart. Oh, Lord. We got to guard what we've gained, right? Do you know that God promotes us based on our personal life and our performance? God promotes people this way. In 2 Timothy 2, 2, he says, And these things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust them to reliable men. Reliable men. Who will also be qualified to teach others. Listen, men. Does God consider you qualified? That's the challenge. Are we qualified to be the men of God that he wants us to be? Are we settling with just to be average spiritually when God desires us to to go for it? Now let's look at verse 3. Here's the job description. Nehemiah comes right out and gives the job description. He says, says, now the gates are not to be opened uh, too early. That means when the sun is hot. Wait until the sun's hot. Imagine this. They get up in the morning. People want to get out and get to work. So they open the gates. Well, if they're going to be attacked, they might get attacked right in the morning. So he says, I want you to wait till the sun's hot, which is like 7 o'clock in the morning over there, okay? All right, granted, okay, maybe 8, okay? But he's saying, don't do it too early. Let's wait until everybody's ready. If they're going to be, let's get our guards in place. Then he says, I want you to look at this next part. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, before they've gone home to take their naps, right? Have them shut the doors and bar them. In other words, don't wait until night when they can be an ambush coming in. Close them up early to set a guard. You and I have to set guards in our life so that the devil cannot sneak his way in. That may be on your internet. That may be on your television. That may be things that we just don't want to have in our life that we've got to shut down so that we're not having our minds go away from where God wants us. Set up boundaries in your life to protect your marriage, to protect your holiness, to protect the the things that God's doing in you so that you don't lose spiritual ground in your life that God is wanting to take over and to to rule for you. He's, uh, uh, He's desiring to allow you to be a holy, godly person, transform you. Don't let it lax. And then it says, and appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards and some at their points. And so he really gives them this thing. Here's the third reason we want to set up a guard. Because God keeps meticulous records. And he does it for a reason. Do you know that God keeps track of everything we're doing? Everything we're doing. And that's in a good way. And here, this is a great way. If you read on this list, he says, and and God put it in my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the common people. We're the common people, right? Because we're not priests. 
We're not in the officials. We're the common people, and they matter to God. And, I, and he says, I found the genealogical records for those who have been first to return. Now, have you ever, let's be honest, how many of you have ever read the whole Bible or read a lot of it, right? Okay, a lot of you have. Have you ever get to those genealogies? You're reading through the Bible. How many of you, I'll be honest, I see that genealogy. Sweet, I got to skip that list today, right? I'm moving through that list of names because I'm just going to move. I got to check off an easy chapter right there. I'm moving on to chapter, whatever it is, right? Because you just skip that chapter because you're like, who? I can't read all these. Now I don't know who they are. And I'm like, these names don't matter. They matter to someone. You know who they, who they matter to? They matter when it's your name. When it's your family's name. They matter when it's God's family's name. So he puts those names down. He writes those names down who belong in his book. Who belong in his book. In 70 AD, the Romans attack Jerusalem. They sack it. It's first sieged for almost two years. It's, and and they, they take over and they destroy it. They raise the city. Anybody ever been to Rome? And you've seen the Arch of Triumph, right? Titus's Arch, as you're, if, if you're at the Forum. If you're, if you're looking here, that's, that's the Colosseum. You walk over this way to the Forum, and you, for, first thing you see when you come into the Forum is the Titus's Arch. What is it? If you look on the inside of Titus's Arch, I should have shown you a picture when I saw it there a couple years ago, you will see the menorah. They marched that menorah back to Rome, right out of the temple. They took the temple down. They carried it back. Where is the Ark of the Covenant? We know in Washington, D.C. I saw Indiana Jones, okay? <laughs> right? They didn't get it. They didn't get it, right? We don't know where it is. Honestly, we don't know where it is. There's a whole bunch of ideas where it could be. Nebo, there's a whole bunch of different places where they think it could be. I don't know. I think it might be down underneath in the caves, uh, in, in, in Solomon's. There's some places down underneath. Oh, I'll tell you more stuff about Jerusalem. I can't. I don't have time, okay? What were we talking about? Okay. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, so they lost, what, what, one of the things they lost at, at, at when, when the temple was raised, all the records of who the high priests are. All the, put the next bullet up so I can say this. In 70, all the records of the high priests were lost so there could never again be a human high priest in the temple for the Jews. In, we learned from Tisha that in 70 AD there was this, this uh, I think I got a picture coming. Can you show me the picture? This is a couple of Hebrew words. I had to say them right. Okay. So, uh, teklet is the color for blue. It's found 49 times in the Old Testament in Hebrew. Okay. The blue is, is that color there. This is the color. It's the color that Lydia will trade called purple. So, same deep, dark, rich blue. Okay. On the, on the prayer shawl, the talit, the prayer shawl, they, 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 they have these strings, these tassels at the end, the, 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 the tzitzit. What it's called, okay? These little things, and um, you will say "l'shem mitz the tzitz," and that's in the name of the mitzvah, or which, or the mitzvah is order of, or the the practice of, or habit of. And when they pray this, and it's very expensive color to harvest. But this shell was this this um, miric shell, um, and this miric shell disappeared in 70 A.D. It was it was for for many many years. It was only found on one seashore in um, in Israel in the north, and it was gone. And in 1948, it reappears. The year Israel becomes a nation again. Just amazing. It just shows up. But, but this time, on the, there's no blue in it. The same exact uh, 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 Mirix snail, seashell, um, when it was found, it has no purple in it. And I, to me, that's like a miracle because there's no way there will ever be a human priest. Hebrews in chapter uh, 4, verse 14, I put it on there on your thing. It says, therefore, since we have a high priest, who is that? Jesus, Jesus right? Sunday school answer, okay? Who ascends into heaven, Jesus, son of God, let us firmly hold the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he didn't sin. And so let us, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace and, and help in our time of need. And in Hebrews seven seventeen, it tells us this, you, Jesus, are a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Here's what we see, both physically in a miracle with a shell that's gone and the nation comes back, but it doesn't have a chance to have a high priest because there is only one high priest, Jesus Christ, Right? And it's when the nation Israel will finally realize that Jesus is the Messiah that they have missed, they can turn to him. But they will never realize. They now are doing, if you see Ancestry.com, they're trying to, 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 
through DNA, try to find who are the high priests, that they can find another way to figure out who the high priests are, but they can't. They never will be able to. And why are these records so important? Because at the book, the last book, it's called Revelation. And in chapter 20, in verse 12 through 15, he says, I saw the dead, great and small, that means you know, powerful people and not powerful people, standing before the throne, and the books Books were open, and another, but there's a whole bunch of books filled with names, filled with names listed in these books, right? And it says, and then there was another one called the Book of Life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. That should scare you. Not you, because you believe in Jesus, but everybody else, okay? Okay. And the sea gave up the dead and all that were in it, verse 13. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he's done. God repeats himself. It's important. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire was the second death. But if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, meaning, but if your name is found in the book of life, you're not going into the lake of fire. That's our hope. He has t- he's written my name down, in the, and, and he remembers, and if he remembers who gave what money in the, in the building of the wall, and he, who was there, and the, he is going to remember whose name is written in the book of life, hopefully mine and yours. And that comes when you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. When I'm sharing the gospel with someone in, in bed, and, and sharing about, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you? are going to die. Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? Have you confessed that Jesus is your Savior and your Lord? And have you been baptized in the name of a Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Have you not? And he said, no. And I said, can I baptize you right now? And there was my Kirkland bottle of water right there. I've done it before. Right, Chris Hansen? Remember, you called me and told me to come over. I went to the hospital for, for I think, who was that? Okay, cool. Okay. That's where I, but he, but he, he accepted Christ, and we baptized him right in the hospital the same way. Kirkland water works, okay? And so I'm not saying it's holy, okay? Um, but, but, then, but he said, and, we, and, and he said it was cold, right? That's what he said. But he was baptized, and then he passed away not even a day later or about a day later, right? If you call on the name of the Lord now, you will be saved. Amen. Your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Application for today. Here's number one. Okay, what spiritual areas of your life are you possibly losing ground because you are being neglectful? Listen, are you being neglectful? Anything in your life? Your Bible reading, church attendance, small group attendance. What are you neglecting that you need to get back on track with? With saying, Lord, I need to up my faithfulness game to you. Lord, I need to really put you first. I'm sorry, I I need to confess this and I want to put you first. Second thing is this, simple to say. In what ways can you grow in the area of faithfulness to God? If that's the area, how are you going to do it? What's the step of growth for you now? Are you going to commit to reading your Bible this week? Say, Lord, every day this week, I want to be in your word. I want to have time with you. I want to really commune with you, God. That's, I, I love you, I know you, and I want to walk with you every day. That's where I want to challenge you. I'm going to ask you this morning to stand. Okay, that's the song we're singing with. At the end of stand. I want you to surrender. That song is I'll stand with our arms high and hearts abandoned. Listen, abandon your heart, your pride, and say, Lord, I'm going to give it up. I'm just going to say, Lord, I stand with arms high and hearts abandoned in all. I surrender, Lord. I'm going to surrender. That's how we're closing today. And the prayer is this. Lord, I am going to surrender to you. I am going to give it to you. And I'm going to stand, Lord, with Nehemiah. I'm going to stand with Jesus. I am going to stand with the saints that believe in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to make my stand that I am going to guard these things in my life because I want to serve the Lord. Is that where you are? Joshua said this. As for me and my house, we will Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. And we are so blessed to see that Nehemiah is calling the people to be on guard, to guard these things in their life, to become the people, the community of faith. Lord, let us continue to strive after loving Jesus and being the community of faith that you call us to be. Lord, help us to be more faithful. And let that, that, that description of Hananiah, a man more faithful than others, be made of us. Let us not let you down. Let us serve you with a whole commitment in our heart to love you in every way and to serve you, to trust that Christ died on the cross for our sins and to come after you wholeheartedly. Let us not be ashamed and let not our enemies triumph over us. 
We give it all to you today, Lord, and we stand in honor of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand?